Thank you for coming. Nice turnout to our beautifully renovated La Selva Beach Library. And I need to tell you this event is sponsored by the Friends of the La Selva Beach Library. Yeah, <laughs> let's hear it for the Friends of the La Selva Beach Library. That's great. Dr. Robert Strayer is a historian with a particular focus on world history. He has taught at the university level at SUNY Brockport, UCSC, CSU Monterey Bay, and Cabrillo College. In addition, he was a visiting professor of world and Soviet history at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. He has received awards for excellence in both teaching and scholarship. His published works include books on African, Soviet, and world history. But to those of us who live here in La Selva, Bob is our resident historian. He's Bob to us, and he is our valued neighbor and friend. So I give you Dr. Robert Strayer or Bob Strayer to, uh, to speak with you for the next hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Five women have played a major role in getting this event going. Mary is one of them, who is from the Friends of the Santa Cruz Library. Cindy Jackson is another one. Sandy <laughs> has made this possible too. And uh, Sarah is our resident technological guru. And of course, our own Galena, the director of the La Selva branch. So thanks to all of you. I am sure that all of us recently have been sort of transfixed by this war in the Ukraine and on its day-to-day -day unfoldings, both the horrors that we witness through social media and the news and the bravery and courage that is exhibited in that conflict as well. Because we are so transfixed by the day-to-day -day events, we may neglect sometimes to step back and take a somewhat larger historical context. And that is what I would like to try to do today. A couple of caveats. When we speak about context, it is a way of understanding. It is a way of explaining what happened to account for the events of our time. It is a way of making meaning in the chaos of random events. However, we also often feel the need, especially in circumstances like a contemporary war, to take sides, to assess blame, to assess responsibility. And sometimes context gets in the way of doing that. Sometimes it feels like explaining something is also somehow excusing it. And so historical context complicates our assessment of blame and responsibility. I will be focusing primarily here today on context and explanation. And I will leave judgments, the assessment of blame and responsibility to each of you. One other thing, of course, is that we need to be sensitive to our own myths, our own stories, our own experience that may shape or misshape our understanding of what is going on. I also want to say that my own expertise in these matters is distinctly limited. I'm a generalist, a big picture sort of world history guy. And my knowledge of Russian history and Ukrainian history especially is quite limited. So I simply want to put that out lest you get uh, sort of unrealistic expectations. So today I'd like to highlight two contexts, two dimensions, two historical frameworks within which we might cast this god awful war that is unfolding before our eyes and on our screens. The first of these is a cultural context, the second is a geopolitical context, and they are, of course, related. Now, I also want you to notice what I'm going to leave out. I will refer to Putin, of course, but I am going to get into psychologizing Putin, assessing his motive, his decision-making process. I will focus on the context in which Putin is embedded. I'm a historian, not a psychologist, and so I'm going to leave that dimension of the whole situation um, largely out of my presentation. So we begin with culture, with culture and nationality. 
First of all, I'd like to present very briefly what I take to be Putin's understanding, which corresponds to what Russian nationalists have, have, have thought for quite some time. In a paper he wrote in July of last year, which is available online uh, and which you may want to have a look at, Putin said, and I quote, that the, that the Ukraine and Russia are, quote, one people, a single whole. From the Russian point of view, there are three in 2017 in, in their feminine dimensions. They are Great Russia, Little Russia, and Bellow, or White Russia. Russia is the name that uh, Russians have given to Ukrainians. In this view, in this nationalist view to which Putin subscribes, these three Eastern Slavic peoples share a common linguistic heritage. They share a common historical origin in the state known as Kievan Rus, which emerged in the ninth century of the common era. More about that later. And they share also a common um, religious heritage in Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And in the nationalist view, this makes them one people. Furthermore, since the middle of the 17th century, the territory that is now the Ukraine has been a part first of the Russian Empire and then of its successor, the Soviet Union. So for over three centuries, um, what is now the Ukraine has been a part of the Russian and then Soviet um, states. Now, Putin and Russian nationalists generally claim friendship and respect for the Soviet Union. Here is what he wrote in 2021. We respect Ukrainians' desire to see their country free, safe, and prosperous. But then he added, I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Now, this outlook, this point of view, reflects a semi-mystical view of Russia, Mother Russia, Holy Russia, Sacred Russia, and its role in world history. Since the mid-16th century, there has been an idea floating around Russian intellectual circles that casts Russia as the third Rome, that is, the third major center and protector of Christianity. The first Rome, the Rome that's in Italy, of course, collapsed and so lost its centrality in the Christian world. That role was then taken up, according to this view, by Constantinople, the uh, center of Byzantine or Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Byzantium was conquered by the Turks in 1453 and became a Muslim city. And at that point, the third Rome, Moscow, arose. This slide here shows Russia, symbolized by this cathedral and by the red building, which is the Kremlin, arising out of the um, the Roman Colosseum. This is Russia as the third Rome. This, this outlook views Mother Russia as a defender of Christianity and of moral purity, and in recent centuries against the moral decadence and materialism and secularism of the West. This view also casts Russia as the victim of many aggressions by the Mongols, by the French, by the British, by the Germans twice, uh, and more recently by the West in general. More about that in a minute. And so this understanding sees Russia's current mission as restoring a lost unity, a unity that has been decimated largely by external aggression. Putin sees Russia according to some observers, as the centerpiece of a Eurasian political project. It affirms Russian orthodoxy as the religious basis for this uh, Eurasian project, and it defines Russia as the defender of traditional morality against the secularism, the individualism, the materialism, and the moral decay of the West. <clears throat> 
So if that is the Russian nationalist and Putin's outlook, how does this hold up compared to historians' understanding of the Ukrainian-Russian relationship? Well, in the first place, historians in general believe that ethnic, national, and cultural identities are not fixed and eternal. They are not rooted in ancient, they are not necessarily rooted in ancient times, but are often quite recent and deliberately constructed. Many contemporary uh, national identities are relatively recent, dating from the late 19th century or dating from the 19th century or later. Contemporary nationalists generally seek to ground these identities in a larger and deeper historical framework. They seek a usable past, which they can employ to root their contemporary identities in some larger um, historical and maybe even eternal context. So that, for example, Russia, the Ukra uh, Ukraine, and Belarus all link their origins to the ancient state of Kievan Rus. This is Kievan Rus as it looked around 1054. It got going around 850. The Mongols did it in uh, around 1240. It was an ancient state. As I mentioned, both Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus look back to this ancient state as the origins of their contemporary state and their contemporary national identity. At the time, however, there was no such thing as Ukrainian or Russian identity on any widespread basis. There were a variety of East Slavic speaking peoples wandering around Eastern and Central Europe. This state, which was conquered by the Mongols in 1240, has no direct relationship to other states, to further states that were on, um, that came to exist in this territory. Now, about the question of Russian statehood. Russia was conquered by the Mongols and ruled by them for about 200 years. During that time, the city of Moscow emerged as a major tax collector for the Mongols. And when the Mongol rule ended around 14, 100, 1450, something like that, the Mongols sort of faded away. Moscow emerged as the center of a new Russian state. This Russian state, and this is important to grasp, I think, this Russian state was born as an empire because within a century or so, this Russian state, which began here in Moscow, began to expand, as you can see on this map. So Russia began its historical life as a state, really as an imperial state, as an empire, requiring therefore an emperor to hold it together. Now compare this with the experience of West European countries, Britain, France, and so forth. These countries became empires, yes, but they did so only after they established themselves as nations. Russia, on the contrary, has in its almost its historic DNA, this imperial outlook, which may account for some of what we see going on today. Now, about the Ukraine. There was seldom an independent Ukrainian state on the territory that is now Ukraine. Putin is right about that. Statehood eluded the people's of Ukraine for a long time. The territory that is Ukraine today was overrun, taken up, conquered by, governed by a number of empires. First was the Mongols, later the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that you see on the map. Parts of Ukrainian territory were governed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and of course, uh, by the Russian Empire. And Crimea was for a time uh, ruled by the Ottoman Empire. In the mid 17th century, there did emerge a state. It was known as the Hetmanate, the 
a Cossack state in the Ukraine known as the Hetmanate. Now, this was a state created by Cossacks. Cossacks were runaway serfs who militarized and um, sold themselves as, as um, mercenaries, essentially, to other peoples. There was a Cossack state established um, in the current territory of the Ukraine uh, in the mid 17th century. There is very little evidence that it had a distinctly Ukrainian identity uh, at that time. Now, Ukrainian nationalists in, in the last century or so have claimed it as a Ukrainian state. There's little historical evidence that it had much of a Ukrainian identity at the time. Most people were peasants or serfs. They were townspeople or members of a particular village. They were more concerned about their social relationship with their landlords, many of whom were not Ukrainian, many of which are, were, were, uh, were Polish, for example. Um, and they were not very much worried uh, about the ethnic identity of their distant rulers. This state, however, this Cossack state, in 1654, aligned itself with Russia in order to maintain whatever independence it might have had relative to uh, Polish, Lithuanian, and other imperial systems in the area. This Cossack state chose an alliance with Russia as the best of its bad options. And so from that time, from 1654, uh, territory of the Ukraine, Ukraine was, um, was a part of the Russian Empire and uh, remained a part of the Russian Empire um, or its Soviet successor until 1991. So uh, Putin is, is that um, the Ukraine has seldom had an independence of its own. Now, in the 19th century, however, there is the beginnings of a Ukrainian ethnic and political identity, largely among intellectuals, among collectors of folk tales, writers, poets. And this identity was based largely on the, um, the uniqueness of the Hungarian language, although it is clearly related linguistically and, uh, to Russian and other East Slavic languages. During the 19th century, a number of intellectuals did begin to foster this notion of a distinct Ukrainian culture, although, of course, it had no independent political expression at that time. This kind of what you might call romantic nationalism was quite common in Europe. Historians refer to all of this as the invention of tradition, the invention of tradition. That, that is to say that while contemporary nationalists see this as the revival of an ancient tradition, historians see it as the creation of a relatively new tradition which sought to link it to events in the past. One of the leading figures in this romantic nationalism in the Ukraine is a man named Taras Shevchenko. Um, I put this poem up there. He wrote this poem and in 18, and it has in recent months, and you can see why, if you read the poem. Dear God, calamity again. It was so peaceful, so serene. We but began to break the chains that bind our folk in slavery when halt. Again, the people's blood is streaming. Like rapacious dogs about a bone, the royal thugs are at each other's throats. Again. So, Chev, uh, Shevchenko's poetry has been um, widely recited uh, as Ukrainian nationalism found expression against this Soviet invasion. When the Russian Revolution occurred in 1917, there did emerge for two years an independent um, Ukrainian People's Republic. This is a stamp from 1918 uh, that uh, is from that period of time and from that state. It was very brief, however, and it was pretty quickly swallowed up. Ukraine was swallowed up within the emerging Soviet Union. 
as one of its founding republics. So here is the Soviet Union, and there is Ukraine. It was one of the founding republics of the Soviet Union. Now, strangely enough, it was during the Soviet era that Ukrainian national identity took shape on a wider basis. So it's fairly recent uh, that this has happening. The Soviet Union provided several things that facilitated the development of a distinct Ukrainian national identity. One of them was a state. In the Soviet Union, the Ukraine was recognized as a state. It had a parliament, it had a government, it had its own um, sort of Republican apparatus. And it, it had the apparatus of a state, though it was in no way an independent state. It was pretty much run from Moscow, like all of the other uh, non-Russian parts of the Soviet Union. However, a number of people from Ukraine achieved prominent positions in the Soviet hierarchy. Khrushchev himself, Brezhnev, Chernenko were all from Ukraine, although uh, at least for Khrushchev and Brezhnev, I think they, were, they had Russian parentage, but they were living in, in Ukraine. So the Soviet Union provided Ukraine with a state apparatus, even though it was not a fully independent state. But there was more. There was also a great uh, expansion of education and literacy. It was a priority for the Soviet Union. This is a flyer from the, from the Soviet literary campaign. It says, women learn to read. And at the bottom, it's, it's quoting the young girl who says, oh, mama, if only you were literate, you could help me. And by 1929, this expansion of literacy and of educational opportunities proved to be a great boost to the, the development of a Ukrainian national identity. The other thing that was part of the entire Soviet experiment was massive and rapid industrialization. This is a dam known as the Dnipro Dam. It was built between 1927 and 32, and it simply illustrates Ukrainian industrialization during the Soviet era. That industrialization was accompanied by a massive movement of people to the cities, as is always the case. And so um, education, literacy, industrialization, urbanization, these were processes that were set in motion in the Ukraine during, uh, the, uh, during the Soviet era. Furthermore, during the 1920s, there was a policy known as korenzatsia, or indigenization, in which the Soviet authorities actually allowed and encouraged education and publishing in local languages, non-Russian languages. This is a flyer from a Ukrainian publishing firm that shows their imprint. And uh, I present it there simply to illustrate this process of the Soviet Union actually encouraging during the 1920s what they were trying to do is to, is to counteract what they called great Russian chauvinism by allowing non-Russian peoples to have a measure of national independence, but not real political independence. By 1929, almost all Ukrainian students were in schools in which Ukrainian was the language of instruction. So this kind of policy was a big boost to the development of a widespread Ukrainian national identity. However, from the 1930s on, the leadership of the Soviet Union feared that this was getting out of hand. And so they began, or continued, the policies of repressing native cultures, native Ukrainian nationalists, and trying to Russianize people as much as possible. One expression of this in the Ukraine took shape in the early 1930s and gave rise to the Ukrainian famine. 
which killed millions of Ukrainian peasants. It was probably not, as it is sometimes portrayed, it was probably not a deliberate attempt at genocide. But it was an effort to break the spirit of Ukrainian peasants who were resisting the collectivization of agriculture, resisting moving into their in, into these state farms or collective farms that the Soviet Union was, was uh, setting up. It was also used to purge or eliminate more extreme Ukrainian nationalists within the Ukrainian Communist Party and Ukrainian nationalists who operated outside the party as well. So this terrible event in Ukrainian history uh, the bags of grain here symbolize the effort of the Soviet leadership under Stalin uh, to secure as much grain as possible so that they could export and use the money for industrialization. And they forcibly did this. They, they were taking even the seed grain from these people. And this is what to the Ukrainian famine. Further examples of this effort at Russification non-Russian identities occurred in education. All Soviet schools were required to teach the Russian language. The great purges of the late 1930s, so-called terror of uh, Stalin's terror, aimed itself at nationalists who wanted to oppose Stalin's radical policy. Stalin himself praised Russia as the leading force in the Soviet Union, and the idea developed of a unified Soviet people using the Russian language. So what I'm saying then is that some combination of Soviet encouragement plus their subsequent and efforts at Russianization contributed, both of them contributed to the growth of a Ukrainian national identity. And so when the Soviet Union collapsed, under following Gorbachev's policies of glasnost and democratization, those policies opened some space for the expression of the ethnic and national identities that had developed under Soviet rule. Some even began to speak about independence. It was in 1988 that I went to Russia for the first time and our group visited Lithuania. And during that visit, the Lithuanians apparently, we were told, flew their own flag for the first time since becoming a, incorporated into the Soviet Union. But they flew it upside down because the youngsters who were doing this did not really know which way the flag was up. So I was not in the Ukraine during that time, but uh, this, this uh, experience uh, has remained in, in my mind. And so when the Soviet Union completely fell apart in late 1991, Ukraine emerged as an independent state, a genuinely independent state for the first time. There were elections in the Ukraine in 1991 and the electorate voted with a 92% majority in favor of independence. In conclusion about culture, even if Ukrainian national identity was late to develop. By the late 20th century, it was there. It may not have had the deep origins that Ukrainian nationalists claim for it, but by the end of the 20th century, it was definitely Ukrainians were a people and they had and wanted a, an independent nation state. However, for Russians, it was a big blow, especially to Russian nationalists who found it hard to imagine Russia without an empire, and especially without Ukraine. And all of this, of course, was confirmed in spades by the Russian invasion in February. If there was any doubt about the existence of Ukrainian nationality, there was no longer any doubt. And in one of the grand ironies, Putin himself has created or perhaps solidified what he has long denied existed. Putin, I have seen him quoted as the father of Ukrainian 
nationality. There is nothing like being invaded by a neighbor to increase your own sense of a distinct national identity. Now, moving on to the geopolitical context in which this war takes shape. The independence of the Ukraine in 1991 became an increasingly prominent issue in Russia's relationship with the West. And this relationship has a long history. You may remember from your high school history that Peter the Great in the late uh, 17th, early 18th century sought to westernize Russia. He built St. Petersburg, which was to be a window on the West. He made Russian nobles shave off their beards and look more like European nobles. And this generated an ambivalent response among educated Russians. Was Russia a backward European country required to follow the lead of the West? Or was Russia something distinctive, something unique, something, something Slavic, something Orthodox, something Asian because of its Asian empire? And some even have suggested that the, the Mongols had imprinted a distinctly Eastern outlook on Russian culture. On one of my visits to the Soviet Union, I remember coming out of uh, the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, and I got into a conversation with a guy outside. He was a dentist, actually. And within five minutes of our conversation, he said to me, he said, you know something about our country. You speak a little bit of Russian. Tell me, what do you think? Are we Westerners or are we not? Now, I had read a lot about this, but hearing this come from a perfect stranger after a five-minute conversation really imprinted on my mind the significance of this identity question. Now, from a political point of view, in the 19th and 20th century, Russia was one of the great powers of Europe. But it was frequently invaded from the West. It was invaded by Napoleon in 1812, from which we get the overture of 1812. It was defeated by France and Britain in the Crimean War and humiliated by being required to dismantle their Black Sea fleet. They were invaded by the Germans in World War I. During the Russian Civil War after the revolution in 1918-1920, the British, French, and Americans in um, provided military assistance to the so-called white or anti-Soviet forces, another example of Western intrusion. They were invaded again, of course, by Germany in the Second World War and suffered horrendously. Um, 25, 27 million people died. There is hardly a family in the Soviet Union that um, did not experience um, death, catastrophe uh, during the Second World War. One of the things that Russians do so well is war memorials. Even as late as the 1980s and 90s when I was going there, um, brides would take their bouquet for their wedding bouquet and drop it off at the local war memorial. So that war has had a long-term impact on Russian, on the Russian outlook. And then, of course, after World War II, and during which the Soviet Union was allied with the West against Nazi Germany, but it was a marriage of convenience, not of affection, and it broke down very quickly and evolved into what we know as the Cold War, which lasted from uh, the late 1940s until at least uh, 1991. The collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, was a represented a partial loss of, of its empire and a great humiliation. Furthermore, there was a fair amount of Western gloating about the triumph of capitalism over communism, of democracy over authoritarian rule. And so there, was, there has been a long history of rivalry, antagonism, and ambivalence about the West within Russia within Russian life. Now, the independence of the Ukraine in 1991 
was widely viewed in Russia through this lens, especially by Russian nationalists. In the 1990s, West apparently had triumphed. We had won the Cold War, and Western political and economic life seemed to be the wave of the future. There was the expectation that Russia itself, the 1990s, democratic Western, they were even offered a place in NATO at some point. Not too seriously, I suspect, but there it was. Furthermore, Russia had been terribly weakened by the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so perhaps it was not so necessary to take account of its views. And so, in this context, the enlargement of NATO became and remains a critical issue between the United States and um, Russia. In order to get Russian agreement to the unification of Germany after the collapse of the Soviet Union, many promises were made to the Russian authorities that NATO would not move one inch further east if Gorbachev agreed to the reunification of Germany, which of course, you know, for many Russians was a scary proposition, having been invaded twice by Germany, now to see the country reunited. But Gorbachev did it. And he did it with the understanding, at least from his point of view, that NATO would not move closer to the Russian border. George Bush, H.W. Bush, and uh, James Baker, the Secretary of State at the time, made those kind of promises. So did the leaders of Germany, France, and Britain. Now, none of this was codified in a treaty or a formal declaration, but it was widely understood. And so it is understandable. Russian resentment and sense of betrayal is understandable when NATO did begin to expand in subsequent years. First, it was Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, which had been part of the Warsaw Pact military alliance. Later, it was the Baltic states, which had been actually part of the. Now, it's understandable that these East European countries would want protection against Russian aggression. And Americans did, as I mentioned, hold open the possibility of possible NATO membership for Russia. However, this expansion of NATO was condemned strongly by any number of major American political figures. George Kennan, who was the author of the containment against Russia, said it was a terrible mistake that we were provoking the bear and we would live to regret it. He called it a fateful error and the beginnings of a new Cold War with Russia. Putin and Yeltsin before him vigorously protested about this, but to no avail. And so when Ukraine began to express an interest in NATO, and when in 2008, NATO issued a document called the um, Bucharest Declaration, which halfway invited the Ukraine and Georgia to apply for membership in NATO, it was a red flag for Putin. Russia was recovering economically and militarily from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And to Putin, an independent Ukraine moving toward another example of Western seeking to weaken or constrain Russia. The Warsaw Pact, the military alliance of Russia and the East European countries had dissolved in the early 1990s, the Russians asked. Rather, from their point of view, NATO continued to enlarge, even uh, to the possibility of accepting the Ukraine into NATO. NATO enlargement pushed the NATO borders flush up against Russia. To Putin, all of this was anti-Russian. And I think that to Putin, Russia is not so much at war with Ukraine, but at war with the West in Ukraine. Furthermore, Ukraine moved not just politically toward NATO, expressing an interest in membership, but it also embraced Western values as well. In the so-called Orange Revolution of 2004, uh, it was a widespread protest against fraud and corruption during a presidential election. Uh, that election was annulled and a new election was held, but it showed a commitment to Western-style democracy. 
and represented Ukraine moving culturally toward the West, as well as politically and militarily. Something similar happened in 2014 during the so-called Maidan uprising. It was a massive protest against the elected government of President Viktor Yanukovych. And what triggered it was last minute rejection of an agreement between the Ukraine and the European Union, which had been approved by the parliament. But under great pressure from the Russians, Yanukovych um, ended this agreement. And that is what triggered the Maidan uprising, which like the Orange Revolution 10 years earlier, um, affirmed Western style political values, democracy, regular elections, respect for human rights and the like. And of course, it, at this uprising triggered uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and triggered um, Russian incursion into the Donbass region of, um, of the Ukraine. We often read that the Russian war was unprovoked. From Putin's point of view and that of Russian nationalists, it was thoroughly provoked and had been provoked for some time by the expansion of NATO. And in their view, um, NATO's effort, the Western effort to limit, constrain, and maybe even possibly disrupt Russia and its Eurasian role in the world. Clearly, the Ukraine, an independent Ukraine, is a serious obstacle to Putin's vision of a Eurasian Russian, which restores Russia as a Eurasian power, which in one way or another sort of reconfigures the Soviet Union, although without communism, and which seeks to defend Russia and Orthodox Christianity against Western aggression and cultural intrusion. And so Putin continued to demand that, uh, that the Ukraine be forbidden from joining NATO. That led to this major military buildup in February uh, and the subsequent invasion. It is hard to know which is more important, the cultural context or the geopolitical context. But clearly, they are both present and they are clearly related. So I think I'll stop at this point and see if um, some of you might have questions or comments uh, to continue our discussion. For those of you in, in Zoom land, uh, you can uh, submit a question in the chat box and uh, Sarah will read those out. If you have a question here in the audience, and Mary has a microphone. Excuse me, just wondering about the Crimean takeover in, in 2014, right? And the lack of Western effort about that. The Crimea had been part of Russia until 1954. In that year, Khrushchev, who was from the Ukraine, transferred Ukraine from the Russian Republic to the Ukrainian Republic. It was a kind of gift to his home, homeland. So people thought perhaps this is, this is yes, a violation of, of, of a border, which ought to be forbidden in this new era of international relations, but maybe it is understandable. Furthermore, uh, the population of Crimea is largely Russian. And there was an election in which um, the Crimean people voted in favor of annexation by Russia. Ukraine has not formally acknowledged this, although it seems like that is likely to be part of outcome of this war. But Crimean invasion, I think, was seen as a sort of special case. More controversial was the Russian invasion or support for separatist movements in the Donbass region of southeastern Russia. That is also substantially, but not so completely, Russian speaking. I'm not sure exactly what the percentages are, but at least half the population there is native Russian speakers. That complicates the situation. Of course, there are Russian speakers in all the Baltic republics. There are Russian speakers in Georgia. There are Russian speakers in Moldova. Um, 
So do we want to open that door in the Ukraine? But the United States provided uh, or encouraged that they all be transferred to Russia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So at the moment, there are no nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, maybe the Ukrainians wish they would have kept a few of them. Uh, they don't have any now. First part of your question was about the neutrality similar to Austria. Oh, neutrality. Yes, yes. Uh, and Austria is, of course, not the only example. Navian republics have uh, countries have not joined NATO. Switzerland is uh, is uh, neutral in this sort of way. Uh, Finland uh, is as well. So there are an, a number of models of neutrality that might be possible. You can understand from a Ukrainian point of view why this seems less than desirable. Well, what the Ukrainians are now saying, I mean, Zelensky in the last few days has been talking about some form of neutrality, but he conditions that on having some form of international guarantee for Ukrainian independence. So I suspect that some form of neutrality and that pretty clearly NATO membership is off the, is off the table at this point. And I think everybody more or less assumes that. Third Rome, does Putin identify with the Orthodox Church? Orthodox Church. One wonders about his own spiritual life and <laughs> religious commitment, uh, but he, is, he has aligned his regime thoroughly with that of the Russian Orthodox Church. And, and he has aligned it with a defense of traditional morality. Um, Feminism is not so alive in, in Russia. Nothing gay or lesbian is uh, endorsed or approved. A lot of this sort of thing as um, Western decadence. I think we have uh, a question from Zoomland here. Yeah. Any insight into whether nonviolent civilian re resistance was a significant factor in 2014, as opposed to military operations. That much about the current or the recent. Ukrainians divisions into the Donbass region. There has been continued sporadic thing there. But uh, as far as I know, the Maidan uprising was more a peaceful protest against the established Ukrainian government. Russian invasion occurred after that had been overcome and a new government was installed. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on all these issues. I, I'm hoping to ask to, to remind me of when the agreement that NATO wouldn't be uh, increased closer to Russia, when was that? It was not a formal agreement, but there were a series of discussions between Western political leaders, George Bush and James Baker on our side, Gorbachev and Shevardnadze on the Russian side. And the issue was whether Germany would be reunited. Russians were skeptical about that. They had been bled white by the Germans in living memory. And so you can imagine their skepticism about allowing Germany to be reunited again. Nonetheless, Gorbachev agreed. The agreement from his point of view was conditioned upon no further expansion of NATO. Ukraine would be independent, but it would not be a part of the Western military alliance. And of course, shortly thereafter, the Eastern military alliance, the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. So the Russians didn't see any reason why NATO should continue when the Warsaw Pact was gone. Uh, 1989, 90, 91. Yeah, in the years surrounding collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, how will this conflict end, in your opinion? I became a historian to not speculate about the future. Uh, I don't know. Um, I suspect that um, at, at, at a minimum, uh, Ukraine will have to forego membership in NATO formally and officially, declare neutrality, and that it will have to recognize at a minimum uh, the Russian seizure of Crimea. Uh, what will happen in the, in the Donbass region is more up in the air, but it seems to me that those two things are almost certain.
in 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 uh, ninety one, the Gorbachev and when they were splitting up Germany or when they're reuniting Germany, how could they leave such an incredible detail out of a document when you're making an agreement of something uh, obviously that that important? That just doesn't make sense, you know. Or 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 what is it, is there another reason you leave it out? No. Yeah. Okay. It, Thanks. It, <laughs> It might well have prolonged the whole process. You know, the West was eager to get Germany reunited quickly. And a treaty has to go through the Senate. It, it could be a long process. I will say that since then, the Americans have sometimes said that that, that agreement or, or those conversations were with the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. And therefore, it doesn't apply to Russia. Uh, this is something that the Russians find difficult to accept. Um, and, the, and they observe that it was not codified into some legally binding agreement. Uh, but from the Russian point of view, they had an agreement and it was betrayed. And that's the provocation that has led to this. Do you think the Russians would stop fighting without taking Odessa, or do you think that Odessa was a major objective? I honestly don't know, John. Well, he was asking whether Odessa was a major objective and whether the Russians could stop fighting before. Please call on me as a historian, not a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> there are ports on the Black Sea. Um, Russia has historically wanted access to and through the Black Sea. And so, yes, that has historic resonance for the Russians as well. About uh, the Russian Orthodox religion, I know Stalin was against, was going to make everybody atheists. So what happened with that? And, <laughs> <laughs> and when did this resurgence of uh, Eastern religion start? It under Gorbachev. This was, okay. part, this was part of Glasnost. Uh, and atheistic propaganda, a reopening of uh, churches and mosques, uh, the uh, allowing for the publication of the Bible, of the Quran, and a number of churches that had recently reopened, some of which had been museums of atheism. Uh, they created museums of atheism in a number of uh, churches during the Soviet regime. And I remember, in, at least when I was there in 88, Glasnost was just getting started. Um, I went through one of those. And then was subsequently reopened. I attended uh, several Russian Orthodox services in beautiful cathedrals uh, when, when they were reopened for the faithful. All kinds of religion flooded into Russia then. I remember going into a restaurant one morning and there on the television screen in the restaurant was Jimmy Baker of all things, you know? <laughs> uh, and all, all kinds of fraudulent American evangelicals. Maybe one further question from Gary. Oh, do we have one more? Okay, well, this is it. <laughs> Last Thank one. you. Um, well, one way to define a people is uh, in speaking their own language. So I'm curious, how distinct is Ukrainian from Russian? And uh, how? And in your view, um, do you see Ukrainian culture as a distinct culture from uh, Russian culture? From what I understand about 50 to 60 percent of the words are similar in Russian and Ukrainian. The grammar is very similar, Eastern Slavic languages. Most Ukrainians speak Russian. Russians do not speak Ukrainian and can understand smidgens of what it, uh, but clearly it has become a distinct and separate literary language, not completely divorced from Russian. And I suspect that a lot of Russian high culture, uh, you know, has um, is admired by Ukrainians. But there is enough difference to provide the foundation for a national identity. I don't know how to compare it, you know, uh, but by now there is a distinct Ukrainian language and uh, there's enough difference there to sustain a, um, a separate political identity. Well, thank you very much indeed for your, for your kindness. I'd like to thank Sarah for the, the Zoom, Galena, Cindy.
other librarians. And um, Cindy wanted me to tell you, if you shop at Deluxe Foods, make sure to say when you go up to the checkout, please put whatever. I don't know how you just, all you have to do is say La Selva Beach Library. And we get money. We get a percentage of, of everything that you buy there. So um, anyway, that has contributed to a lot of, of wonderful things we've been able to do here. And Cindy thought that if we, you know, if you didn't know that, then now uh, we can kind of enlarge our, our um, realm of people who do that. So anyway, thanks so much for coming. So many people. And thank you so much, Bob. That was great. Excellent. Mm -hmm.